So today, we're going to define a few things. Junk volume, stimulating reps, talk about progressive overload, how to progress exercises, how to progress progress with your body, with your strength, performance, etc. Um, starting off, I think it's very important to understand the relationship between intensity and volume. So to quote my friend Eric Tadera, uh, in absence of quality, there is volume, meaning effective reps are going to be reps in close proximity to failure, or they're going to be very high quality reps taken close to mechanical failure. If we don't have the ability to, one, execute a, a rep or a set well, then we're not going to be able to train a super uh, meaningful stimulus close to failure. So skill always comes first. That doesn't necessarily mean a skill exercise like a pull-up, barbell row, barbell bench press, dumbbell presses, etc. It could be as simple as a dumbbell curl. So a very novice lifter probably is not going to be able to even train a dumbbell curl close to mechanical failure. They're probably going to break down in skill first or technique first. Understanding an absence of the ability to actually hit close proximity as a failure or, or train a, a high quality movement, we're probably going to want more volume to make up for that. For a, like a higher skilled lifter like Joey or like myself, more like intermediate to advanced people, um, we're probably going to want less of that. We're going to consider that junk volume. So junk volume would be reps that are uh, less stimulating. I'm not going to say not stimulating. I'm going to say less stimulating. So a effective rep, we would quantify or qualify as uh, being reps in close proximity to mechanical failure. So that, that means skills there, techniques nailed in. And then we also have the ability to hit close mechanical failure. So we're not going to voluntarily give up when we think that we're done. Ultimately, our goal is to nail in quality. Once quality movement's there, our goal is to calibrate mechanical failure um, for skill movements, uh, for strength movements. Quality comes first. Yeah, Everybody I would say has. simplistically, the simplistic way of looking at it is get really good at performing an exercise and then do that exercise in close proximity to failure. That's gonna be your best way to gain muscle, get big, get strong, all the things that you want in the weight room. If you get really good at an exercise and you know how to execute it correctly, then go ahead and load it and load it until you get to close proximity to failure and then continue to do that. Um, so junk volume, where does junk volume become an issue? Especially with more advanced athletes like Joey, people who are competing in powerlifting, or like high level bodybuilder, people who are training heavier loads or, or higher speeds. The more junk volume we have, the more fatigue we're gonna accrue. So both from like a neurological fatigue standpoint. Within our workout, we're probably gonna be nerfing our intensity just by a product of the fact that we're doing so much, or so many reps, so much workload. Also, from like a general like physical fatigue standpoint, we're gonna increase the likelihood for injury if we're doing like three hours of field work every day plus an hour in the weight room, you know, for doing a shit ton of reps, right? Like we're gonna be wearing down the body more. Um, so understanding like we don't need that much volume to actually grow muscle, to actually increase strength, to increase performance. We don't need a shit ton of volume. We need a lot of quality volume. So. Again, going back to that, in absence of quality, we want to improve quality first. So we're probably going to have a little bit more volume when the quality is low. Once quality is there, we're going to be striving to actually lower volume. Low volume, high volume approach. Low volume approach, don't get it twisted. You'll see a lot of people who do like a lower volume approach. So like one to two sets on everything, but they do like 10 exercises. So by a proxy of that, we're actually doing a moderate volume or a higher volume. Low volume. We, we want to be able to actually be hitting a lot of sets in close proximity to failure without technical fatigue. Um, if we can't do that, we're going to want a higher volume. So more novice lifters, there's nothing wrong with doing higher volume. You hear a lot on the internet about like high volume being bad. High volume isn't bad. We just understand these things, understand quality comes first, understand we want to actually calibrate our ability to train close to mechanical failure. So we don't want to be voluntarily giving up. We want to actually get comfortable with getting close to that point. Um, and after that, we kind of make our training decisions based on that. So. We'll get into like choosing rep ranges here in a second, how to progress those and how to match up an exercise. So cut, cut from what he was just saying though too. Technical failure has two parts of like why you need to do it. One is to get better at the movement so you don't get hurt. The other one is to load the muscles that are being utilized in those exercises effectively. Right, so, so like you're we saying another day. Yeah. It's like global tension versus effective tension. So yeah. Like, mm. yeah, so like when you're doing these technical exercises to induce hypertrophy for our mechanical failure, you need to have the, a certain intensity put correctly on the muscle to induce that hypertrophy. So we talk about even like a single arm lat pull down. We're trying to get into the position to get the best stimulus on the lat so that we can induce hypertrophy of that muscle. If we're pulling in a position that's not going to be best for the lat, then we're not going to be able to induce hypertrophy like we want to of that movement. We're still going to get some growth. We're going to get some mechanical, like 
physical change, but it's not as good as it should be. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's both injury prevention as well as uh, stimulus of the muscle. But like a lot of times, people limit weight or intensity of a movement because they're afraid of injury, mm -hmm. but then they load them in more volume. Do you kind of see that as like yeah. an oxymoron? Like you're trying to save injury because yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't load them heavy, but then you give them more volume, which in turn sets them up for injury. An acute injury presents itself when you get more like, uh, uh, you get over volume or like too much workload, it presents as like an acute injury. It's so like a torn ACL might seem like it was just in that moment, which like to the extent that it happened, it was, but it's probably more so, uh, it's more causal because of the, the built up fatigue you've accrued from a shit ton of workload throughout a season. Yeah. Right? So like it's, it's usually not from that one cut that just fucked you up. It's like, oh no, like I have, I've decreased my ability to co-contract my muscles correctly or, or effectively. So in that split second, when I cut, I tear my ACL because that fatigue has affected that, right? So Most issues with loading stem more from like a low quality of movement plus loading. Yeah. Because like we're loading the shit out of movement and we don't actually do it well. Yeah. So therefore like there is a higher likelihood of injury. Yeah. Versus like uh, fatigue just on a decreased quality, right? So if we have too much fatigue, everything we do is gonna suck. So if we did six by 20 on this and then go, went and tried to do any other chest press, like the quality of that movement's probably gonna suck. Our ability to have high, high output's probably gonna suck. Yeah. If we have so much fatigue so that we could practice, we roll up to the game day on Saturday or Sunday and we're like limping around, then like our quality on the field's gonna suck. Like our ability to sprint, our ability to cut, plug me nerve. If we go do field work and we do like 30 seconds of rest between like our sprints that are supposed to be anaerobic, we're turning it into a road, but we're decreasing the quality of those sprints. Yeah. So in a lot of different ways, fatigue can negatively affect quality of movement or quality of performance. But then also, to fix that doesn't mean for you to not do anything or to not do it with intensity. It's just to utilize the intensity correctly. So if you're gonna do something that's a high intensity exercise, give yourself enough time to recover so that you can do it again at the exact same intensity or same movement quality versus sacrificing yeah. movement quality due to time restraints, not recovering fast enough. Like obviously if you need to progress recovery intervals and be able to recover faster, there's an ability to do that through aerobic capacity. Constraints of exercise should allow for quality. Whether your goal is strength, whether your goal is power, whether your goal is hypertrophy, whatever it is, the constraints should be set where you can have higher quality. Yeah. So rest, environmental constraints via external stability, even like the environment, you want to be motivated to exercise. But all those things are going to affect quality of movement, and we should always consider all the things we can do to make sure that the quality is the best so we get the best stimulus that we want. Even myself, when I was younger, if I wrote for my own self-programming, obviously there's the understanding that I need to master these movements. But then, like, sometimes I already had mastered the movement, but I would try to get something that I knew I could do for 10 versus knowing, like, I should be getting to 10 and almost be failing at 10. That's why I love rep ranges. I think there's like a misconception that like if you don't hit a certain rep number that you're you're gonna like not see progress. Yeah. Like, oh, I had three by 10 and I got eight reps, so I failed. It's like, no, probably not. Because it's like, what's gonna be, what- You almost what, probably got more benefit out of failing at eight than you actually hitting 10 and having more reps in reserve. Right? Yeah. And so it's like, if I'm training a strength adaptation and I have a three by five, I probably wanna pick a weight that I can actually get five for every set because I'm trying to get really good at moving that weight, right, in that general rep range. Yeah. I'm just trying to improve quality, I'm trying to improve scale, skill, I'm trying to get more exposure to that weight, versus like hypertrophy, it's like I want to get reps in close proximity to failure. So if I'm hitting 10, 10, 10, then my first two sets probably weren't actually in as close of proximity to failure as my third set. Versus if I did like 10 and I actually went to failure, then hit eight, and that's where I failed out, it's like I'm still getting a good amount of reps in close proximity to failure set three, if I get like six, seven, something close to that. Yeah. It's like my goal with that was hypertrophy. So I want to get reps in close proximity to failure. So all three of those sets, I achieved that. Versus if I did on 10, 10, 10, I would get way less reps in close proximity to failure. If you're trying to get technical work, then yeah, I want you to hit 30 full reps of a, of a moderate weight to where you're mastering the movement. We can always narrow this back down to like one of shallow saying, which is just like practice skill, train output. Skill exercises can become output exercises, right? So if we nail our skills so well that we can train a more technically challenging exercise close to failure, then like we can go ahead and do that and get meaningful output, output from it. But especially on exercises where we want to get like uh, more like output 
Right? Usually it's more externally stabilized. We want to get reps close proximity to failure. We, think we want to push that failure point. Yeah. So we're going to practice skill, get quality down, and then train output. And then when it comes to like choosing rep ranges, for our virtual stuff especially, it doesn't really matter. As long as we're in that like 5, 20 rep range, and we're accruing a lot of reps in close proximity to mechanical failure, we're doing good. So it's yeah. like what we were saying, like we like to kind of choose like a wider rep range, like 6 to 10, 8 to 12, maybe even like 12 to 15. We kind of like to just kind of week one, I try to find a weight that's probably closer to the bottom end of that range. So here, if we're doing 6 to 10, find something that's hard between like 6 and 8. That's our baseline for next week. Across the weeks, we're going to push that until we can get closer to 10 reps. Once we hit 10 reps for most of our sets, then we're going to add load, do it all over again. So the rep range doesn't really matter a whole lot. What matters is our proximity to failure, getting those good quality effective reps in. From a standpoint of like things that are more loadable, probably want to load it. If you have an injury, if you want to kind of do more load management, pick a higher rep range. This is, that's going to make absolute load lower. Cap kind of the, the clusterfuck of things I've talked about already. Um, so we need to understand when volume is more appropriate. So understand the relationship between intensity and volume. In absence of quality, there's going to be volume. When there is quality, when there is a good calibration for intensity, then probably want to do lower volume, more reps, plus proximity to failure. We're really looking to get a lot of effective reps. Junk volume we define as reps that are not going to be in close proximity to failure. So we don't want to accrue a lot of fatigue from less meaningful reps. The goal post is kind of always going to be get a lot of quality reps in close proximity to failure. Um, choosing rep ranges for exercises, anything between like 5 to 20, even higher, is probably going to be good. Understanding that what matters the most is getting those effective reps. So for things that are more loadable, Joey and I tend to usually pick like lower rep ranges, like 6 to 10, uh, or like 5 to 8, something in there. For less loadable, more like isolation exercises, we usually don't do like sets of 6. Doesn't mean that we wouldn't grow big delts if we were doing sets of 6 and lateral raises. We just tend on isolation exercises to pick usually the upper range, like 8 to 12 are like 10 to 15. So progressing those, week one, everything's novice or novel. Find a weight that's challenging on the lower end of the rep range, progress from that. So the week after, start with that weight, push it until you get the upper end of the rep range. And then once you hit the upper end of the rep range, you can add weight the next week. Keep progressing that until you can't anymore. Uh, when finally you hit a plateau for several weeks, what we can do is just change up the stimulus. So instead of doing this uh, horizontal chest machine right here, sending upright, Maybe I'll do like the Atlantis incline over there, another chest machine, right? Just pick something new, we can do the same thing on, progress that for eternity, eat enough food, sleep well, train hard, you're gonna get jacked. Is that what Jordan said you said? Practice skill, train output. So that really is just saying quality first. So we're trying to get good at something, we don't want to have any hairy reps. Like we should, the constraints should be when a rep goes to shit, we're done. That's our failure point. So practicing skill, Practicing quality, improvement quality, however you want to say it. That comes first. After that, training output. Training output really is just the pursuit of trying to get close to mechanical failure. So for a lot of people, it takes a while to actually get in tune with their body and understand what they're capable of doing. So really pushing the limits of what we can do in regards of like getting close to mechanical failure, that true like zero RIR. Once we're there, push it. Like I said, with rep ranges every week, try and improve. Uh, I think there's also a misconception that like progressive overload is going to be determined by the fact that if we add a rep every week or add a pound, that you're we could there. come in and we could do like a very similar stimulus, eat no food, sleep, we're probably still going to grow. When we zoom out, we should have progress still, but if I have three weeks in a row of like pretty consistent training, I don't make a lot of improvements, it doesn't mean that I'm not growing or that I'm failing. When I zoom out, I should see that. So if I do that and I keep doing that and I keep doing that and I'm not progressing, that's going to be a different issue.